Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining um, our UCT virtual UCT Africa virtual meetings. Um, we're very honored this morning to have Christine Rogers, who's one of our Dizzy specialists. We always love hearing presentations from her. Um, and this morning, she's going to do another one for us on um, the psychological issues and the Dizzy patient. Um, there will still be a few people joining the meeting, I think, but I think for the sake of time, we can probably start the meeting. So a very warm welcome to everyone joining us this morning. Uh, Christine, we're so excited to hear from you again. Um, when you're ready, you can, um, you can start the presentation. Thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. And just before I start, thank you so much for the invitation. Just before I start, um, just something um, from my last presentation, the context of my last presentation about management of functional disorders was in the context of the dizzy patient. Um, and one of the participants asked about the role of ABR and so on, and I said it's not indicated. Clearly, that is with reference to the dizzy patient rather than patients with functional hearing loss. So I just wanted to clear that up. Okay. So let's talk about psychological issues and the dizzy patient. And um, this is something that I'm going to take slowly and gently because I know it's not everybody's absolute favorite. Let me just move it on. Right, there we go. Okay, so I thought we would take a trip around the world given that this is a, an audience from across Africa. And it's very important to know what's happening in your region as well as what is happening in other regions. So I just did a very quick little look at the literature as we started. And if you practice in Jordan in the Middle East, well, they had a, re and all of these are recent studies. These are studies within the last two to three years. Um, and this is relevant to ENT patients, which I think is really interesting. So some of these studies, these were patients who were there for nose or throat problems, not particularly specialized to dizziness. And in Jordan, quite a big study, um, 1,328 ENT patients, and they found depression in 36% of them and anxiety in almost 23% of them. So just in your waiting room, three out of 10 have got depression and two out of 10 have got anxiety. While in India, they zoomed in particularly looking at patients with vertigo, and as you would expect, the percentages of depression and anxiety are higher there, almost 50% with depression and 44% with anxiety in their um, population of patients with a preventing complaint of vertigo. And the prevalence of these was most likely, uh, was highest in Menis disease, which I think isn't really a surprise because we know that Menis disease is a life-changing diagnosis. But interestingly, vestibular migraine came a very close second in terms of having the second highest prevalence of patients with depression and anxiety. And then in China, and this was a study of inpatients. So these are patients that one can presume have got a blend of surgical and medical problems severe enough to warrant hospitalization. Here we go, 79.5% of them had depression and 16.4% had anxiety. And both these figures, when related to uh, the national uh, normative database and for other hospitalized patients with an exception of respiratory patients were far, far exceeding what was expected. So very high levels there. South Korea, um, I was lucky enough to go to um, a vestibular congress in Seoul, and the South Koreans are really very, very active in research into vestibular issues. In their series of over 500 vertigo patients, about 20% had high levels of psychological distress, 11% had depression, and 18% had anxiety. And I think what was interesting out of the South Korean study is that the average age group of these patients was about 46 um, years old. And I think that's significantly lower than many of our dizzy patients. So much younger population, but still these psychological issues are prevalent. And the diagnosis, again, this is the South Korean study, um, with the highest level of psychological distress was vestibular migraine. And what I thought was interesting in this one was that a third of the patients actually had BPPV. And you wouldn't think that BPPV is going to trigger major psychological issues because the attacks usually 
are very short duration. You're talking seconds and they're actually predictable. You know, patients say, well, when I do my head like this, I'm going to bring some vertigo on. But this does correlate with other studies, which suggest that BPPV does have a negative impact on patients' quality of life. So overall, the South Korean series was showing much uh, lower numbers of patients with psychological distress than many other authors. But those researchers still recommended routine questioning of patients for psychological distress. Very small series of 90 patients from Japan. Patients with intractable dizziness present for more than three months were investigated by audiology, ENT, and psychiatry. 70% of them qualified for a psychiatric diagnosis, with the most common diagnoses being depression, anxiety, and somatic symptom disorders. And these authors noted previous work that between 30 and 50% of dizzy patients have symptoms that are not fully explained by their vestibular diagnosis. So, you know, this is a worldwide problem, and there's no real reason to think that the narrative is going to be any different in emerging regions. So looking back, well, for a long time, we've had descriptions of seasickness, fear of heights and dizziness found in very ancient texts from Roman, Greek and Chinese literature from um, about 730 BC. And Vertigo was actually mentioned by Hippocrates. But it took a long time for Vertigo to get into the textbooks and it appeared in the first neurology textbook in 1840. But interestingly, at that point, there was no link between the presence of vertigo and vestibular lesions. And it was only after we started understanding work about the vestibular anatomy and physiology that it dawned on people that vertigo might actually be coming from the inner ear. Then in the 1870s, three German doctors started to link the eyes, the ears, the brain, and the psyche in patients presenting with dizziness. Um, also with patients presenting with visual motion stimuli and anxiety in open spaces, in other words, agoraphobia, fear of the marketplace. And interestingly, at that point, one of these doctors uh, reported that fear of or anxiety was a normal reaction to neurologic illness in his patients. And it seems to be a pity that we've actually lost sight of that. And as I mentioned in my functional presentation, clinical neurotology uh, really came into its own in the first half of the last century. Um, and that was about the same time that clinical psychiatry started moving away from clinical neurology and clinical neurotology. And vast vertigo was linked to vestibular system deficits. Um, uh, the notion that it could coexist with anxiety and various so-called psychosomatic symptoms including, as they then termed it, psychogenic dizziness, which is a term that we frown on now, were viewed as coming from unconscious conflicts. And then much later, the DSM-3, which obviously now we have DSM-5, DSM-3 um, and 4 and 5, are really the sort of psychiatrist kind of handbook as to how to categorize psychiatric disorder. Um, the third edition started reconsidering vestibular disorders in the light of panic attacks and agoraphobia. And patients with panic disorder have higher rates of vestibular deficits than expected, while patients with vestibular lesions have higher than expected rates of panic. So this was suggesting this kind of bidirectional relationship. Okay, so three relatively new terms. In the 1990s, uh, the German collaboration um, from Munich uh, postulated, Brandt and colleagues postulated about something called phobic postural vertigo. This will be a, um, a, a term that is familiar to you all. And then the notion of spatial and motion discomfort and visual vertigo, which is now referred to as visually induced dizziness, started being explored. And these um, uh, terms started exploring issues of persistent vestibular symptoms and dizziness as distinct from vertigo. And interestingly, all of these three descriptions included features of fear of public spaces and agoraphobia that have been described over 100 years ago. So space and motion discomfort and visual vertigo were described in patients with 
neuroatologic dysfunction, but were later found to be present in patients with primary anxiety disorders. And then by the end of the um, 20th century, there was this slow circling back to the previous century's theories with an unresolved debate about vestibular symptoms and anxiety. Further research perceived, um, showed that perceived threat and anxiety could impact normal balance function. And this gave us a framework for understanding the links between the brain's threat and anxiety networks and balance symptoms in both normal and vestibular patients. Uh, phobic postural vertigo became a diagnosis in its own right. So this is relatively recent that we started to describe this um, intertwining of anxiety and uh, psychiatric issues with vestibular symptoms. It's been relatively recent that um, it started to become a diagnosis in its own right with set criteria. So note that these are not just kind of waste paper baskets where you chuck a diagnosis in because of lack of any, um, anything else being demonstrated. And um, phobic postural vertigo was distinct from active neuroatologic and psychiatric illness. So it was reformulated into the term chronic subjective dizziness in the um, early 2000s, 2004. Lots of work by Staub, who is one of the main writers in this area. And then in 2017, the International Classification for Vestibular Disorders started um, wanting us to call it um, persistent postural perceptual dizziness, in other words, 3PD or triple PD in 2017. And we've had a very nice uh, presentation this year on triple PD, which was really impressive. And then after um, all of these new uh, conceptualizations of very old disorders, studies followed with looking at conditions like vestibular neuritis and BPPV and examining medical and behavioral outcomes. And these studies suggested the interaction of medical and psychological factors. So, you know, you get this kind of perfect storm that then promotes the development of persistent vestibular um, symptoms. And then thereafter, the first few studies of success with SSRIs, cognitive behavioral therapy, and vestibular rehabilitation therapy were published. Okay, so now we're going to have a little look at just exactly what is normal. And there's some quite interesting kind of um, data here. And these, um, what I'm going to say next is about patients with no neuroatologic or psychiatric diagnosis. This is just looking at simple balance related tasks and the changes as these balance related tasks became more difficult. So the first thing they got their normal participants to do was to rise on their toes. So just stand on your tippy toes from normal stance. So just feet in a neutral position just underneath the hips, rise on your tippy toes. And then they got the patients to do it on a high platform versus a low platform. So the actual motor function is exactly the same. And then they got them to do it at the edge of the platform. And um, as the patient's, um, uh, as the balance challenge increased, patients actually became more and more hesitant about doing it, even though rising on the toes, it was this interplay of the perceptual difficulty because of being on a high versus a low platform. And of course, then it makes you think about fear of falling coming in as well. They then got patients to walk on, um, not patients, uh, participants to walk on a walkway and as the um, patients were on a high versus a low walkway, the higher the walkway, the slower patients walked. And if it was high and narrow, then it was slowest of all. Then, and this is something that is extremely relevant. And if you just take a patient for a walk in a busy waiting room, you are going to see this. Once patients start having to actual dual tasks, so once they're doing walking plus another activity, like walking and talking, for instance, they tend to respond more slowly and walk more slowly as the path is getting narrower and higher. And then something as simple as just leaning forward towards a target, um, doing that at different levels. So putting patients on a one meter plinth and getting them just to lean forward from their hips and then a higher plinth of three meters, which is to be fair, fairly high. And that perceived lean 
was actually greater um, at the higher kind of level. And the fear and anxiety increased and balance and confidence decreased. So these are things that are all possible to do physiologically, but this interaction between uh, mind and perceived threat is incredibly powerful. And the lesson we can take away from this is that when um, balance is challenged in normal participants, it reduces performance. So that's the first thing is. And the second thing is that the older the participants were, the more marked these changes were. And many of these activities induce really marked fear of falling, um, reduce balance confidence and increase autonomic activities. So, you know, these are real physiological changes to balance in normal participants. So I'm sure this, these terms are familiar to you, but I thought I would just refresh your memory about the difference between state anxiety and trait anxiety. And state anxiety is an amount of anxiety in an individual at a specific point of time. I've got an exam tomorrow, I've got a presentation tomorrow, I've got to be up early tomorrow, so it's going to affect my sleep, okay? And heart state anxiety does not suggest an anxiety disorder. So as I say, this is often with a situational kind of trigger. But the interesting thing is that state anxiety can affect the processing of visual cues rather than vestibular or somatosensory input, as well as affecting postural control. So they put participants on um, a balance board and they immediately had uh, much more, um, they, they were much stiffer in terms of their postural control um, strategies, and they made much more postural corrections to their stance than normal individuals on the same test. It also, interestingly, and I think this is something that's important because a lot of older adults do have kind of worry, um, and even if it's state anxiety, it definitely seemed to worsen age-related degeneration of balance reflexes in older adults. So trait anxiety is a tendency to become worried. So these are patients for whom, you know, I think therefore I worry. Worry is the kind of default setting. These are the sort of worry warts and we've all seen these kind of patients. And patients with high trait anxiety tend to have reduced body sway with the eyes closed when they're performing a demanding mental task. And again, they have this stiffening, which is what normal people do when um, presented with a balance challenging, but they are holding themselves differently, even when there is not a balance challenge that is there. And so trait anxiety, and this is important from a therapy point of view as well, trait anxiety also seems to impact um, visual stimuli processing. So patients become a lot more dependent on visual cues even if those cues are incorrect. So in other words, if you put them in a virtual reality setting, they are going to be um, much more impacted because they are listening, if you like, more to the visual cues, even if they're wrong, rather than listening to their vestibular inputs. And so obviously this actually kind of changes how, how you are functioning at a brain level. So this is a patient undergoing vestibular posturography, and vestibular posturography really increased our understanding about um, how postural control works with various challenges. Um, so looking at vestibular function and patients with panic and anxiety disorders, what do we know about that? So the first thing is that panic disorder patients are much more likely than normal controls to have at least one abnormality on calorics, optokinetic, or autorotation tests. So they actually do have non-specific abnormalities on specialized investigations. So there's something going on there, but there's no consistent pattern of a diagnosable vestibular deficit. Now, I think this is um, because of the lack of the um, sensitivity and specificity of these tests rather than the fact that it's that we can't demonstrate the abnormality rather than the fact that there's no abnormality. Um, so these patients often do have subtle vestibular deficits, but the role of heightened anxiety on normal vestibular function can't be ignored. So are we setting up for continued monitoring pathways, for example? 
Um, we also know that longitudinal studies show a progression from an acute vestibular deficit, for instance, vestibular neuritis. We know that at least a third of those patients are going to develop chronic motion sensitivity. In other words, they, we're setting them up, they're setting themselves up for things like triple PD and visual dependence in patients with comorbid anxiety. And so I'll talk a little bit later about, well, will it be helpful if we actually screen patients for anxiety? So posturography out of all of the other tests has actually had more success looking at patients uh, with anxiety disorder and how they perform on balance function. And patients with panic have more body sway on static posturography than control. So in other words, when they're just standing in the parachute like that, this is going to be a condition in which patients with normal vestibular function can do absolutely perfectly, but patients with panic and anxiety tend to underperform on this task. And then with the dynamic phase, so what this thing does, the screen that the patient's looking at actually starts shaking backwards and forwards. It's most um, unnerving. Um, and then these patients tend to be a lot more destabilized once the visual field starts moving, that's the dynamic phase um, of the test. And interestingly, the magnitude of the postural instability correlates strongly with the severity of agoraphobic behavior and anticipatory anxiety. And of course, it's new best friend avoidance behavior. So these patients actually start being fearful in advance of situational, um, potential situational triggers for dizziness. So just to remind you of the signs of a panic attack, one of my favorite questions with um, panic is to actually ask patients, you know, do you ever feel like the symptoms are all coming on at once? And one of the things about panic is it tends to um, build up very, very quickly. Things escalate very, very rapidly. You get all of the symptoms piled up one on top of each other. Um, so does it all happen at once is very helpful. And of course, dizziness is one of the cardinal features of having a panic attack. So is unsteadiness. However, ataxia is most unusual. Occasionally, patients can tell you that this is mild vertigo. So other important symptoms are patients feeling that they're choking, depersonalization or derealization. I tend not to make too much um, of those symptoms. They're relatively common in neurologic practice. I don't get too excited about them. Obviously, the chest pain and particularly fear of dying or losing control. And those are things that you really have to probe for because obviously patients are going to be focusing on their, um, on their physiological symptoms like palpitations and what have you. And as I say, dizziness is one of the most common symptoms in panic disorder. It's present in about 50 to 85% of patients. The attacks can either be uncued, in other words, they're unexpected, or they can have situational triggers. And this is one of the very helpful ways to actually try and identify presence of panic disorder. I once had a patient, there's a, a very nice shop in South Africa called At Home, and it um, sells sort of household textiles and all sorts of goodies. And um, they usually have a bed that's actually kind of made up showing off the latest duvet cover. No, this patient of mine, she always used to get a panic attack at home, which then required her having to lie down on the bed while she sort of gathered herself. Okay, just, just saying, you, you hear it all when you've been practicing for long enough. Um, so, uh, so I said they can either be um, uncued or otherwise they can be um, situational triggers, which is often what we see, like, for instance, um, crowds, uh, shopping malls are a particular trigger, particular shops, pick and pay is a particular trigger, um, known as cued. And as I say, agoraphobia is particularly common in patients with panic disorders. So remember the quality of the symptom here, if dizziness is the primary symptom, they report lightheadedness, non-specific swirling, fogginess, and sensations that sound kind of like um, motion sickness. And as I say, the interesting thing is they don't necessarily um, mention anxiety or they, they kind of downplay that kind of anxiety symptom.
Okay, so. Okay, so you get the idea. Um, the distress is incredibly real. That hyperventilation there is uh, really, really um, apparent. And as I say, just to remember here that there are very few causes of episodic non-vertiginous dizziness with these kind of autonomic symptoms that peak within two to five minutes. So this is coming on quickly. And then it decreases over the next kind of uh, 15 to um, 15 minutes to an hour. But also bear in mind that the symptoms can linger at a much lower sort of level for several hours. So do consider panic if the symptoms match. The other um, symptoms to uh, the other diagnosis to um, consider is vestibular migraine. And remember vestibular migraine when we took our trip around the world often is a fellow traveler with anxiety disorders. Now on examination, there might be dizziness during the procedures, but you're not going to get any signs like nystagmus. And note also a very nice study in tertiary care showing that a primary diagnosis of panic disorder was noted in a third of patients with chronic non vertiginous dizziness, a third, that, that's, that's impressive. Of course, should you see uh, nystagmus or ataxia in patients with panic disorder, obviously that warrants investigation. Oops. Right, okay, so there we go. Okay, so psychological factors that can trigger, promote, or sustain um, symptoms. The first one is this anxiety-related trait of neuroticism, and I've already mentioned the kind of worrywart kind of patient. These patients have persistent low level anxiety and depression that increases with stress. And they often have accompanying um, uh, symptoms like headache, uh, dyspepsia, things like that. And neurotic tendencies can actually influence the development of persistent uh, symptoms after an acute vestibular episode, for instance, triple PD. Patients, in contrast, who are resilient, optimistic, and confident are much less likely to uh, develop a chronic um, a condition after a vestibular insult. So there seems to be this physiological substrate and functional MRI, and I'm firmly convinced that the more we learn about the brain's um, function, the more we are going to be able to explain um, these links. So functional MRI has shown that neuroticism is associated with increased central vestibular activity and increased connectivity between vestibular and anxiety pathways. So, you know, the patients aren't imagining this or thinking this. This is actually just happening at a kind of physiological substrate kind of level. And these vulnerabilities in these kind of personality types might help explain recurrences of things like vestibular migraine, panic and depression. Now, again, pre-existing anxiety that predates the vestibular symptoms is a second issue that can predispose patients to developing chronic dizziness after a vestibular syndrome. In addition, acute anxiety during the acute vestibular um, illness um, actually sets up this kind of monitoring kind of network, which I've talked about before. So patients become excessively vigilant and then they start interpreting even normal vestibular kind of um, activity as pathological. And then again, this sets patients up for persistent dizziness long after the acute episode has passed. And we think that there are two sort of conditioning responses that assist with this um, setting up the pathways. This one is classical conditioning responses. So these underpin the hypervigilance and the increased autonomic um, responses to motion stimuli. So this is why triple BD, it is most noticeable when patients are standing or, or interacting with their um, environment. And then you have operant conditioning. 
that underpins behavioral change due to dizziness. So for example, it's very common that patients come to the clinic and say, well, you know, I won't come out alone. Somebody has to come with me. And sure enough, there's somebody waiting in the waiting room. And both these types of conditioning perpetuate the dizziness. So you get this kind of feedback loop that's set up that needs quite um, um, aggressive management to actually start breaking those, those loops. Okay, so now I always say that you get two types of patients. And um, if the patients have had calorics uh, in VNG, I always ask patients how it was for them kind of thing. And you get two types, okay? You get the first ones that say, yeah, you know, I felt a little bit dizzy, why are you asking? And then you get the patients on the right-hand side of the slide that say, oh, I'm never going to let you do that again. I thought I was dying. It was absolutely terrible. And so this slide is just really a reminder that um, cognitive processes include catastrophic thinking about the consequences of being dizzy. So things like, um, what if I can't get outside or I'm going to crash the car? And anxious preoccupation and thoughts about chronic symptoms also factor in here. So I'll never get better, for example. So these serious illness worries are very important that we explore those with our patients. And then these thoughts actually ensure that the focus continues to be on vestibular symptoms and they tend to promote disability over functional living. And again, I point out this anticipatory anxiety and phobic um, avoidance behavior. And this all adds to the morbidity of dizziness disorders because they are truly restri restrictive in terms of participation in every aspect of the patient's life. And of course, if you correctly identify these kind of behaviors and manage them during the consultation, you can help patients understand where this is coming from better, and then you set them up for successful treatment. Okay, so triple PD, we've discussed triple PD before, um, and it's very important to differentiate this from other forms of dizziness and bearing in mind you can't have more than one diagnosis and frequently you do have more than one thing going on. So often you have the original vestibular insult and then you have this slow but sure kind of morphing, if you like, of symptoms into more of triple PD. And just to remind you that are there are definite diagnostic criteria for triple PD um, and it's not a diagnosis of exclusion. So I'm just going to move on a little bit. I'm just mindful of the time. Okay, so when you are thinking about psychological involvement in your patients, I think there are three key questions that you need to ask. And the first one is, is there an active neurotological condition? And here you've got to consider past and present illness bearing in mind how acute vertigo can evolve into chronic dizziness. The second question is, does the neuroetiological condition explain all of the patient's symptoms? So what about comorbidities? Does the patient, um, for instance, need um, something managing in terms of a many's disease? Or do they actually need SSRIs for triple PD? And I can't tell you how important this is, the amount of patients that I have seen that have seen other practitioners and they have had the, um, the sort of cause but not the symptoms treated, um, even surgically, and yet the, it's actually the triple PD that is most disabling and needs addressing. So just do sort of, you know, that, that's a red flag there. And then the last question is, does the patient have behavioral symptoms that indicate psychiatric comorbidity? And this question is important even if the patient doesn't appear anxious or depressed. You know, they don't all sit there and wring the tissue. Some of them do, but a lot of them don't. So probe about things like anticipatory anxiety, avoidance behavior, and changes in lifestyle and activity that are disproportional to the vestibular deficit. And remember that the clinical examination is much more likely to give you something to get excited about in acute rather than chronic forms of dizziness. So many patients with um, dizziness related to psychological issues are going to have normal examinations. Okay, quick word about screening tools. 
Um, there um, haven't actually been any published studies of the usefulness of early screening for anxiety and it's actually preventing triple PD. But obviously, if you can identify these common fellow travelers early, it's going to be much more beneficial. So the dizziness handicap inventory, I use that a lot. I think that's really good. The hospital anxiety um, and depression scale is something that's very commonly used and it also correlates well with formal psychiatric diagnosis. And then finally, the patient health questionnaire is very simple and short. It's um, very good to uh, detect anxiety and depression. It's free, it has a manual for scoring and um, I can give you the web address for that. It's a very nice one to use. Okay, so what about treatment um, options? And we are still waiting for large scale randomized controlled trials and other treatments looking at uh, managing behavioral morbidity in dizzy patients. But what we do know is that multimodal interdisciplinary treatment seems to be the magic kind of formula. So the first thing is consider the role um, and particularly SSRIs, and I was just looking at a paper yesterday, looking to see who's going to do best. And females tend to do better with SSRIs for dizziness than males. And um, the, the predisposing factors to success also include age and the disease, disease severity. So the worse you are, the more chance you actually have of a favorable result, which I thought was quite interesting. So vestibular rehab, of course, as we all know, is treatment of choice for recovery from acute vestibular lesions. And the mechanism here is supposed to be habituation. So why wouldn't habituation and very gentle and slow um, uh, desensitization to awareness of vestibular cues be helpful? And this approach is um, in when you have patients with comorbidities, as we've been discussing, you tend to go more gently and more slowly than you normally would after an acute vestibular loss. And we also know that VRT reduces comorbid um, anxiety and depression. So psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy is the way to go here. So you've got to know your um, psychologist and you've got to know the approach that they use. So some common fellow travelers, we've all heard patients complaining of brain fog. A big NHANE study in the States talking about patients with self-reported balance symptoms were eight times more likely to report self-perceived difficulty with concentration and memory when compared with patients without dizziness. So this is common. Again, functional MRI, I think, is going to be incredibly helpful. And for instance, we know that patients with bilateral vestibular lesions actually have atrophy in the hippocampus and thalamus, which actually promotes visual and um, spatial issues. Um, uh, we also know that the vestibular system provides input to memory, spatial navigation, and general body awareness. And so we expect and do in fact find difficulty with object recognition and numerical recognition. So when patients talk about impaired memory, concentration, and things like that, we actually understand the basis for this. Okay, so some final thoughts here that, so you kind of take from messages. So perceived threat and anxiety have a really profound impact on balance function, even in normal individuals. And I think that's one of the key take home messages. And that the threat and anxiety system changes the speed and intensity of postural control movement in response to perceived threat. Second, triple PD can and does develop and ensures that symptoms persist long after the acute um, vestibular crisis has resolved. And the main reason that behavioral morbidity in our patients isn't detected is because of us, because we're not actually asking patients, because we have a single-minded focus on the vestibular system as the source of symptoms, and we tend to miss the opportunity to address psychological issues, which are in fact sustaining the presence of vestibular symptoms. The other thing, of course, is that the patient has a, a stake in this as well, and patients are often invested only in a physical cause for their symptoms. 
But remember that three to five of every 10 of our patients are going to have a psychiatric comorbidity. And so we need to consider screening as part of our jobs, be open to it and embrace it. And the final message is that treatment works. Alrighty. Awesome, thank you so much, Christine. That was that was really great. Um, yeah, quite a lot of food for thought there, uh, and lots of stuff we can implement almost immediately. Um, I don't see any questions from the floor at the moment. Um, I'll just give a minute or two. If there's any question that you want to ask, would you mind to either raise your hand or post the chat function? We'll just give two minutes for that, Christine. That's fine. I don't see any questions. Um, we will be loading this video up with your consent to our YouTube channel. Um, okay. I'm sure that there will be some questions that pop up at a later stage. Um, Christine, if it's okay, I'll also just, um, if there's an email where other teams can email you with any kind of relevant questions or problematic patients, if you don't mind, um, maybe teams that are not part of our institution. I think that Perfect. would be helpful if you're happy with that. Yeah. Uh, okay, fantastic. I don't see any other questions at the moment. Um, there's no input from our floor. I think uh, the presentation was so good, we've got absolutely nothing to add. So <laughs> that, that, that's fine. Um, I, I, I just think it's interesting that we don't have loads and loads of participants this morning. <laughs> I suspect it was the topic that scared everybody off. <laughs> I think it's probably also a bit early for everyone on a Wednesday. Um, <laughs> Christine, thank you so much for your time. Um, it's, it's always wonderful to host you. It's always lovely to, to hear from you and um, certainly something we don't get enough input of. Um, so thank you so team, much. From the team here, we want to thank everyone for joining this morning. Uh, we'll be loading it up to our YouTube channel and I'll add an email address for Christine if there's any um, cases you'd like to chat to her. Um, with that, I'm going, to, I'm going to end the meeting this morning. Thank you, Christine. You're an absolute star. Okay. Okay. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Cheers. Bye.